Okay, so, chapter 8. Um, we're looking at contract law, chapter 8. Chapter 8 is promissory estoppel. Okay, waivers and promissory estoppel. Alright, so, let's look into this right now. Okay, part B, waiver, estoppel by representation and folks versus beer. The doctrine of waiver is commonly referred to as, um, referred to in the case Hudges versus Metropolitan Railway Company, 1877. Hudges' case is also known to be the first uh, time when the doctrine of promissory estoppel was developed. In this case, the party were in a legal legal relationship with the distinct terms involving certain legal liability. The uh, landlord gave the tenant a notice to uh, um, notice pursuant to the terms of the lease. Though noticed, uh, required the tenant to do repairs within six months. The tenant sought to the landlord to negotiate to buy the property and said that during the negotiation period, no repairs shall be made. After the negotiation failed and the six months uh, has lapsed, the landlord sought to enforce the six months notice to evict the tenant for non-compliance to repair. The court ruled that the, the, the tenant was led to believe that through the course of the negotiation, there would be no, uh, there would not be any repairs conducted. Waiver is the act of giving up certain legal rights or advantages. It is an inter is an intentional relinquishment of a known right. McCamus states that the um, I quote the doctrine can reboot the other party's allegation that the relying party has engage in a breach of the original contract unquote page 278 in the case folks versus beer the uh, defendant made a partial payment in return for the creditor's promise to forgive the entire debt the um, traditional common law position on this is that an agreement to accept a smaller s sum in satisfaction of a larger debt is not a good consideration this has been overruled by the Law and Equity Act, RSBC uh, 1996, Chapter 253, Section 43, quote, okay, uh, part performance of an obligation either before or after a breach of it, when expressly accepted by the creditor in satisfaction of a re rendered under, or rendered under an agreement for what, for that purpose, though without any new consideration, must be held to extinguish uh, the obligation, unquote. So McCamus describes a typical waiver case, quote, a party relies on the waiver by committing a breach of the contract on the faith of an undertaking that it would not be considered such, page 278. The doctrine of estoppel um, by representation states that one who has induced another party to act to his detriment on the faith of the statement of fact will not be allowed to uh, allowed in subsequent litigation to deny the truth of the fact in question unquote in the case Jordan versus money the debtor released the creditor from its obligation to repay the debt the debtor has agreed that she would not enforce the debt the debtor relied on that statement and was able to afford to get married uh, the creditor subsequ subsequently sued to enforce the debt the house of of Lord ruled that the uh, creditor's represent, quote, uh, representation was not a representation, representation of fact, but rather a statement of something that the individual intends or intended um, not to do. Page 278. In the end, the creditor's claim was allowed. So, Part C, Doctrine of Promissory Estoppel. Okay, so the Doctrine of Promissory Estoppel is a more expansive version of the Doctrine of Waiver, or also known as Equitable. Um, the Doctrine was first described by Denning J. in the controversial case of Central London Property Trust Limited versus High Tree House Limited, 1947. The outcome of this case was that the waiver would not apply to a promise to accept a partial payment as a full discharge of the uh, obligation. Okay, um, the High Tree case is about 39 years lease on a new block of flats in the London uh, 1937 before the Second World War. Uh, 
the new block of flats has not been rented out. All right. The uh, landlord agreed to reduce the price. The leaser paid the rent at the reduced price during the war. The leaser continued to pay at the reduced price even when the whole block was full at the beginning of 1945. There was no consideration to have this promise accepted at the new price, at the reduced price. In the late 1945, the newly appointed um, receiver of the landlord's company became aware of the situation and wrote to the leaser to demand that the leaser would pay at the full rate in the future and in arrears. If you don't exchange the dollar, um, there still can be good consideration. In the London Property Trust Limited and High Treehouse Limited case, there was a promise that was enforceable even though even though there was no consideration. The promise he had given no consideration or whatsoever. All right, um, the doctrine of Hudges would be able to um, help the leaser in the high tree case. All right, it would be able to help them in the regards to the rent prior to 1945. Um, Denning J reason for this would be because the landlord has given a promise that was intended to be binding and intended to be acted upon. Therefore, the promise should be binding. Okay, so number one, shield the sword versus shield. Denning has the opportunity to reconsider the term binding and validity of the case Combe vs. Combe. Combe is a divorce case where the wife is seeking to enforce a promise made by the husband to pay £100 per year. The wife have, had given no consideration for the promise. The wife seeks to enforce the promise based upon the reason that it is binding because the doctrine of promissory estoppel. In this case, Denning refused to allow the, the doctrine of promissory estoppel to be used as a sword by the wife to get money for the husband. The high tree case is an example of a defensive case. Um, Denning LJ dismissed the claim um, in at the Combe case and held that the doctrine of promissory estoppel could not enforce the promise. Relying on the doctrine of promissory estoppel, um, Lord Denning held that the promise intended to be binding in, intended to be acted upon and was acted upon is binding regardless of the missing consideration. All right. So the primary role of promissory estoppel was mainly to prevent parties from insisting upon their strict legal rights in situations where it would not be right to permit the actions um, to enforce. Thus, in the uh, Combe case, the doctrine of promissory estoppel can only be used as a shield, I quote, as a shield and not as a sword, unquote. The tenant was able to use the doctrine as a shield to protect the tenants against the landlord who wanted to enforce the agreement of paying at the regular price. Both High Tree case and the Combe case, the doctrine of promissory estoppel is mainly taking a uh, defensive role in the form of a gratuitous contractual var uh, variations. So to summarize, the principles set out in the High Tree case are as follows. Promissory estoppel cannot be used as a sword. It cannot be used to create new causes of action where none existed before. Existed before. Okay. Number two, the second principle. Promissory estoppel can only be used as a shield. It is meant to prevent a party from insisting upon his strict legal rights when it would have been unjust to allow him to enforce them. All right. So promissory estoppel as a sword. In the in the uh, Gilbert Steel case, the purchaser agreed to pay the supplier more than the original sell price for the the supplier to enforce the agreement will fail because it is using the doctrine of promissory estoppel as a sword. All right, so okay, so that is basically um, the first part of um, promissory estoppel. Um, the next part we'll actually look at um, section two of um, intended to be acted upon of promissory estoppel. Okay, so until next time, um, take care, and we'll catch you again later. Thank you for um, listening in.